Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here tonight at the Real Science Exchange. Tonight's conversation will be a little bit different from our typical podcast, but I think you're going to find it interesting and enlightening. Instead of diving into research projects and dissecting the latest science, we're going to discuss one of the most pressing issues affecting our communities and our country, and that would be hunger and food insecurity. As agriculturalists, we're in a very unique position to tackle this issue, and to provide solutions. And tonight we have brought together some of the players that have already been making a big impact with this issue. But before we get started um, with talking about what your organizations are doing, what I'd like to do is go around the table and have each of you tell us a little bit of personal history and what brought you to the table tonight. And I'm going to start with you, Stephanie. Um, What brought you to the exchange today? Uh, Well, my name is Stephanie Walsh and I work for Dairy Farmers of America which is a national farmer owned dairy cooperative, um, working for about 11,500 dairy farmers across the country, um, starting at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, And I'll get a little bit deeper into the story later. Um, One of our producers gave us $100,000 to start what we're calling our Farmers Feeding Families Fund. Uh, He was moved by the images of his community members waiting in long lines in their car and on foot Uh, for food assistance, and he wanted to ensure that those community members um, will continue to get the dairy that they most desperately need. So thank you so much for having me on today. You're very welcome, Stephanie. Looking forward to your story tonight. Uh, Before we move on, what's in your glass tonight? Ooh, I am drinking a maple latte that I made by myself. I got a milk frother for Christmas, which is the best dairy gift you can give someone. So. We'll be having a a little bit of a latte today. Very nice. Next, Melissa, please share a little bit about your background and uh, then what are you drinking tonight as well? Great. Hey, Scott. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. I sure appreciate it. My name is Melissa Cullison and I'm VP of Corporate Partnerships for Cooler Management. And how I got here is is kind of a whirlwind um, with all the players that are on the phone today, but I just came from uh, the Got Milk campaign several months ago. And while at the campaign, we were reaching, or excuse me, we were spending, you know, multiple years working with Feeding America to get more fresh dairy, particularly milk into food banks across the country. However, when um, we were placing all those fresh milk gallons, unfortunately there wasn't enough refrigeration to take it in. And so, um, you know, Sans pandemic, you know, all that happening. Um, you know, we were been we've been building infrastructure uh, for food banks and food pantries across the country. And I started my position at Cooler Management about nine months ago. And now I'm really being able to make an impact on um, not only getting more fresh items to food banks, but also making sure that they're safe and and properly delivered to their constituents. All right. Thank you, Melissa. And what were you drinking tonight? Oh, and I've got a fresh chocolate milk that I just made at the house. All right, cool. Very good. And I see you brought a guest with you. Uh, Mark, what brought you to the exchange tonight? Yeah. Hi, Scott. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Dinkrot, uh, co-founder of the Oakfield Group. We're a private investment and consulting firm uh, specializing in the uh, ag and food space and also managing partner and co-owner of uh, food management. Um you know, I basically do what Melissa tells me to do. <laughs> he told me to uh, to come to your podcast, but um, you know, in, in all in all seriousness, we've uh, been my entire career. I've been in the uh, farm to table supply chain, uh, working with brands, working with farmers. That's really my background. I've been in dairy, working at DMI um, for several years, and even at uh, Mid East for for several years before that, and. Uh, we saw a need for infrastructure, really, to bring fresh food to, to the people who need it. And so uh, Cooler Management specializes in cold storage, and we acquired the company two years ago, and uh, that's what we're doing today. And Very well. I'm drinking my fair life. 
chocolate mm -hmm. milk. So. Excellent. So you said you've been uh, in uh, uh, farm to table most of your career. That's not exactly right. You had a cup of coffee in the NFL. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Uh, I, I did. I somehow found my way from the University of Finley, Division II school in Ohio, um, many years ago. Uh, 2002, I was a free agent with the Panthers in Carolina. And uh, in 2003, 2004, I was with the Giants in New York. And I, I played a year in uh, in Europe. Uh, back when the NFL Europe League was uh, was going, which, by the way, was the best experience of my life. Most people, you know, when you when you play in the NFL, people ask you that question. You know, what was it like playing in the NFL? It was great. It was a you know, it was a kid's dream come true. But to be a 24 year old and traveling the world playing football, uh, you know, it, it just was a blessing for sure. Yeah, very. I would have done it for free, and they paid me to do it, Scott. <laughs> You know, I wish you knew. right now, Mark. That's the place <laughs> right now, working for you. Okay. Uh, well. bit. <laughs> yeah. And finally, I need to welcome my co-host for tonight's conversation, Charlie Benz. Charlie is Balchem's director of ruminant sales, but he's also played a huge uh, played a huge role in Balchem's Cooler Kids program, and we'll discuss that a little bit more uh, tonight. But Charlie, first, give us a little bit about your background and what's your beverage of choice tonight. Thanks, Scott. Uh, I've been with Balcom a little over five years. Uh, I've been in the industry either on the dairy side or in the animal health side my whole career. So I'm enjoying, you know, the fact that Balcom has not just our animal health division, but we have a human health division that also runs parallel on some of the things we do. So that's kind of a, I'm drinking some Premier Protein. Uh, we enjoy this at the house, plus I use it a lot when I'm on the phone for a quick break when I'm not necessarily getting lunch some days. And this one actually we just found, it also talks about uh, immune health and support. So I'm not allowed uh, being coached by my uh, sister company. I'm not allowed to say that a major choline company that's probably on this show is supplying the choline, but uh, I wouldn't be drinking it if I didn't trust the uh, supplier. All right. So it's all good. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Well, I'll tell you, I'm drinking, I'm drinking Fair Life as well, Mark. Uh, mine has omega-3 fatty acids in it, which supposedly helps the brain. I need that. Um, and I'm also having it because um, Dr. Mike McCluskey, he's been on the podcast a couple of times. So in honor of him, a great product. I am drinking it from a, uh, a wine glass, though. Tonight's pubcast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk, reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit Balchem.com to learn more. Yeah. Guys, I want to welcome everybody here, and uh, let's start off with a toast to uh, the ag industry. Cheers. Cheers. So kind of to get us started tonight, I want to take us back to March of 2020. The pandemic was just hitting and the uh, impact was being felt across the country and around the world. Farmers were dumping milk, if you will recall, while store refrigerators were empty, meat cases were bare. People, especially those in disadvantaged communities, were in jeopardy of not having food available. And all the while, farmers were desperately searching for ways to get their animals to market. So if you kind of put yourself in those times, you know, it's kind of kind of bizarre times. And, and Charlie, I remember still the day that our boss came to us, uh, Jonathan Griffin, and, and he got us together and said, gentlemen, what, what can we do? And he challenged us to find, you know, ways that we as a company could, uh, could help intervene and, and help um, get food to people. And so, Melissa, it was during those times when, uh, you know, when we first met. And, uh, you know, I must say over the last couple of years, you've become one of my favorite humans, right? You know, it's kind of hard to remember what it was like back then but you know we were all locked in our houses we were communicating over zoom and a little bit desperate for human interaction and we had multiple meetings with you as you were teaching charlie and i about the needs and we're coming up with ideas how can we help and i just remember coming away um you know from those meetings being very energized because of your bubbly personality and you know your your can-do attitude so anyway you've been a joy to work with uh, you've been a great team member and i want to want to uh thank you for that that. Um, why don't you get us started talking a little bit about the need um, with refrigeration? Well, 
golly, Scott, you're, you know, just kind of bringing me into tears and then I have to talk on the podcast. Um, but thank you so much. Um, you know, it, it was exactly how you set it up. Uh, I ended up, you know, connecting with you and Charlie in the beginning. We got a connection through um, IDFA, International Dairy Foods. And we had seen that the USDA was putting together all of these food programs. We knew that there was a slew of donations coming in where it was $100 million from Jeff Bezos or, you know, one of the other carers were, were donating so much product because the need from the pandemic was enormous. As, as I think we've all looked and seen it on TV and on and newspapers and on the Internet of just, as Stephanie uh, mentioned earlier, just you know, um, trails and miles of cars wrapped around the food banks and the food banks were struggling at that point. They're getting, you know, $4 billion worth of food that was dumped um, on them. And, and it wasn't that, you know, it was anybody's fault, but it was the, the issue that, uh, you know, there was pandemic, people were getting sick, there was a lack of volunteers at the food banks, and there wasn't ample refrigeration to take in all of these donations that were coming in. Um, and so a lot of those donations that were starting to come in early in the pandemic, they were getting wasted. And it really honestly tore me apart. And, and uh, you know, some of our early conversations, uh, Scott, with you and Charlie was, what are we going to do? How do we fix it? What's coming? And how do we prepare? And, you know, you and I and Charlie spent mornings together and weekends and nights figuring, like, how can we make something work? And us kind of having some privy to information from USDA and in, in, in my role at the time of just knowing what was coming through all the supply chain and all of our milk processors at the times, whether it was, you know, our partners at um, Dairy Farmers of America or, or one of our other um, processor partners, knowing that they were donating so much product, how do we make sure that product is delivered to that end user, to that neighbor in need? And it's a safe product that's not going to make anybody sick, but, uh, you know, it's properly refrigerated through the, the cold uh, chain storage, and it's getting to those families who really need it. And, um, you know, that's when really you guys started the, the Cooler Kids program. I was in the background. And so I don't want to take any credit other than telling you, do not donate food. Let's donate refrigeration. Right. This is what's needed in order to keep all that food safe and get it from being dumped. Um, and, and nobody wanted that to happen, right? Everybody had the best intentions out during pandemic, but we were understaffed. And we, the infrastructure just wasn't there. Um, and so, you know, knowing billions of dollars of, of food was coming in, we knew that we needed to kind of change our efforts to say, okay, we don't want to waste a drop of milk. We don't want to drop, waste any of that fresh food. How do we fix the system to start getting some infrastructure established? And, you know, hence our collaboration happened and, you know, we really, um, kind of just moved into action quickly and you guys really took it internally and started the cooler kids program. And I'm so proud of the program where it's gone to today because um, just the comments that we receive from placing some of the refrigeration units right now, people are just overwhelmed with gratefulness and understanding that they don't have to turn down fresh foods anymore. They don't have to turn down fresh dairy and fresh gallons of milk. They can take them in, store them safely, and get them to um, families in need. You know, one of the things I learned is that the, the need is probably more dire in the, the country locations than maybe the city locations. Can you maybe talk a bit to that? Sure. And I would also ask, you know, um, some of my partners on the phone to speak to it as well. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a, there's a huge focus right now on uh, reaching some of those rural areas and inner city areas. During pandemic, it was like, whoever we can help, we, we can get, you know, we'll, we'll get to. But in some of the programs that we've started with this team and with also Stephanie, who's on the line with um, DFA Cares, it is, there's a focus on rural areas. There's a focus on, um, you know, some of those smaller food pantries that don't get all the attention. They don't get the big fundraising. And that's such a big deal, right? Because those smaller pantries are feeding so many smaller rural focused families 
And those families need the nutrition of dairy as well. And dairy is such a powerhouse of just getting on my dairy pedestal for a second, but just thinking about getting a glass of milk in kids' hands in the morning, that is the difference between learning at school and, and not, you know, them not being jittery and being able to make it through the class and pay attention because they're not hungry. And that is what's fueled my passion for hunger relief and infrastructure relief, knowing that in order to get those very nutrient dense foods, um, including dairy to, to kids and families, the infrastructure has to be there. Yeah. Stephanie, uh, that was a nice segue that uh, Melissa gave us there. Can you talk a little bit about some of the programs that DFA has in place? Sure. Um, so I'm going to talk about our DFA Cares Foundation, which is our 501c3 organization that has been at our cooperative for um, a number of years. Um, so along on this topic, uh, we definitely have a lot of programs that support the food insecure. Um, but we do a, a couple other things that I'll get into, and then we can circle back to the Farmers Feeding Families Fund. Um, so the DFA Cares Foundation also offers education and scholarship to those students that are studying agriculture and things that can support dairy. Um, in 2022, the DFA Cares Foundation provided 53 students with diverse backgrounds, scholarships for their higher education. And this year we made an effort to really try to hit some of the unconventional channels um, as you may know, the amount of farm kids decreases every year and the amount of opportunities supporting agriculture grows. So we want to hear from anyone who's interested, if they're a communications professional, an attorney, what have you. Um, you don't have to grow up on a farm to work for DFA. Um, and we're so excited uh, to support these students and we continue to grow the program every year. We also have a disaster relief response arm of the program, and uh, we really find this as, as part of our community core value. This is just the right thing to do. I'm not sure if I know there's folks from Wisconsin and other dairy states, but if there's a barn fire, usually the farmers down the road are there before the emergency vehicles to pick up the cows and make sure they get milked. So this is in our DNA. This is what we do. Um, and in 2022, we donated $37,000 to 16 families uh, impacted by tornadoes, snow, or fires. Um, we, you can add floods. I didn't have the statistics, statistics from that because those just occurred in, in Kentucky. Um, we donated 24,000 cans of Sport Shake, which is a shelf-stable, um, low-fat flavored milk product. Um, to those impacted by tornadoes. And we also sent $50,000 um, in partnership with the American Red Cross and Convoy of Hope to Ukrainian refugees. Um, so we like to have um, nimbleness in this program uh, because we never know what the next disaster will be, have be it a winter storm in Texas or a global pandemic. Um, and so, like I mentioned before, at the start of the pandemic, one of our family farm owners from the Southwest region, uh, moved by the images of his community members standing in long lines for food assistance, gave us $100,000 to start the Farmers Feeding Families Fund so we can help food banks pivot and be able to continue to serve dairy to their clients in need. Um, so let's go back to how Scott set us up the beginning of the pandemic. And one thing that really impacted the dairy industry, Scott, you mentioned uh, farmers had to dump milk. And it wasn't that we didn't have food and that we didn't want to get it to the emergency food network. Um, but what happened was our marketing realities completely shifted. Um, a lot of our products do go to food service. So if you think about you know, three pound packages of sour cream, uh, those customers as restaurants started to close canceled orders, and we were left with raw, unprocessed milk um, there. So we desperately tried to do the best we could to come up with partnerships to try to get that raw milk processed, and we were successful in that. But then through um, putting so much uh, donated milk into the emergency food network, we quickly realized that maybe they didn't need the milk and maybe what they really needed was fridges. And so we started the refrigeration donation program in late 2020. Um, we've since then established a partnership with Cooler Management to be our exclusive supplier of those coolers. Um, and we've donated coolers across the country 
Um, and we've supported food banks that are in Houston, for example, to um, the Last Mile Food Pantry in Berberville, Kentucky. Um, so we are super proud and excited that through this program, our farmers and our members, our farmers and our staff nominate their local food pantries. And so we're hitting the communities where our plants are located, which is typically um, urban areas, as well as where our dairy farmers are located, which is typically very rural. Hmm. Uh, I mean, Stephanie, you're completely right, right? I mean, DFA, they, they put their money where their mouth is. They're not just talking about it, they're doing it. And just to put a little data behind it, there's over 60,000 plus food pantries in the Feeding America network alone. Less than 10% of them right now have adequate refrigeration and cold storage. Wow. So if you just look at the places where people are going to get food, there's a, a glaring reality that there's a lack of infrastructure. And, uh, and of those 10, you know, of those 60,000, know, 10, 10% no adequate refrigeration, well, what can we do? About it, right? And it's those programs that we're putting in place. But we took it a step further at Cooler Management. We did the pack out. So we've identified some refrigeration, we identified some cold storage solutions. And if we just put refrigeration and cold storage in 50% of those 60,000, which is a big number, it's about yeah. 90 million. But if you look at government spending, 90 million is a very small number. But if we put 90 million into the charitable food system, we would be able to provide a billion pounds of incremental milk sales. And, and that's a real number because we have a goal in the dairy industry to displace, you know, fluid milk, right? And if we put it into the charitable food system, we could do it. And, and we've done that research. We've, we've got the data that supports it. Of course, when you get into the details and you put a, you know, you put a cooler into a food pantry, we used to say it's going to be stacked, you know, head to toe with gallons of milk. But if there was a detailed program in place where we had oversight and we had access to, to fluid milk and we put it top to bottom in those shelves, we could prove that there's a billion pounds of incremental displacement available to us. And so, you know, I'm in this business because of the data, but, you know, there's personal stories as well. You know, as a substitute teacher, you mentioned the NFL. Before I started my professional career, two things. I was a professional softball player for Coors Light, mm. Silver Bullets, $65 wow. a week and a case of Coors Light. <laughs> uh, you know, you're waiting for the phone to ring and you're hoping to get back into the NFL. Um, phone didn't ring. So I ended up obviously getting into the dairy industry and working for ADA Mideast here in Ohio for Scott Higgins and, and June Red and, and Jenny and the team. But you know, you learn really what's going on, boots on the ground. And, um, you know, we've seen it in the in the ump. We've seen, you know, the charitable food system kind of come and go. But I truly believe there is a business case for charitable food system fluid milk displacement because the number one, as we all know on the phone and probably those listening, the number one requested food item in the food bank is, is dairy. It, it's milk. Right. It's nutrient dense. It, it provides for the family, you know, so. And yet 90 percent of the people that, that the, 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 the pantries don't have milk, right, because they don't have refrigeration. They don't. That's and, amazing. And it's a big reason why we, you know, why we acquired cooler management. Like we see this. We see this opportunity from a business case. We see this as a social opportunity. We see this as a business opportunity. And. You know, Melissa will tell you, my, my heart's with the dairy farmers. The best people I've ever met in my entire life are, are dairy farmers, right? They're the salt of the earth. They've taught me more lessons about business and life than, you know, any other group of people that I've met, including football coaches, right? There's a, and the thing is, there's a lot of parallels there. Resiliency, discipline, hard work. You know, there's a lot of parallels there. But uh, it, it, it's opportunistic, right? And, and I'm, I thank you again for, for bringing us on the podcast because... If we realize that there is an opportunity to displace a billion pounds of milk over the next five years in the charitable food system, I think more people like Stephanie and her team at DFA will will see, you know, I mean, there's no surprise, you know, it's not a secret that fluid milk sales have been declining for forever, but why not do the, why not do something good with fluid milk, 
Hmm. Right. Yeah. And there's people that are asking for it. There's people that are needed. And the USDA is buying it. It's not a donation. The USDA is purchasing fluid milk for the charitable food system. And I think one of the misnomers about the charitable food system is that this is a giveaway. This is devaluing the value of fluid milk. That's not the case. We have a government that's purchasing fluid milk and giving it to people who are asking for it and need it, and they're paying for it. Mm. And, and I would love for that message to, and Melissa can speak to this way more eloquently than <laughs> I can, but I would love for, for that message to be heard by, by our audience. Yes, I think I think that's a good point. And, and two two points to make on that is, um, Mark, you know, the the USDA does buy um, a, a, you know, a couple million gallons of fluid milk a year, but it's just not enough. Um, it could be more that they're sending to food banks and, and also in those food pantries. But it is the infrastructure that all the food pantries cannot take that in. Right. If they don't have the refrigeration, if they don't have the staffing, if, if supply you know chain isn't there, cold supply chain isn't there, then reaching those rural locations out, you know, in um, in the country just isn't going to work, even if that food bank does get that those gallons of milk. And so, you know, what I wanted to say, and Steph, I don't want to steal any of your thunder, is DFA Cares does an amazing job of trying to kick that off for themselves. And Stephanie, maybe you want to talk a little bit about the grant that you also offer with the refrigeration, because that's impactful as well, is, you know, DFA Cares has taken it one step further. And I'll let Stephanie talk to this, but they they help place the refrigeration just like Cooler Kids does. But they offer a grant as well um, in order to to uh, ensure that nutrition is making it to all those food pantries that they're placing refrigeration in. Melissa, before we kick it over to Stephanie, you know, we've talked a little bit about Cooler Kids, but we've never really, we haven't talked about what the heck is Cooler Kids. And so I'd, I'd like to get Charlie to come on and just okay. real quick, Charlie, what in the world is Cooler Kids? What's that about? So we started with a small amount of a grant, Scott, to support refrigeration. And, and that was a Balcom grant, right? That was a Balcom grant. And to make it go further, the idea is we'd find partners who are customers usually to match us. And so fast forward, and it's kind of the way I'm seeing, it's it's making me smile, but the whole idea was to get synergy going and create some noise or create an opportunity for people to connect in these local communities and be part of this. And so once we get a partner committing, then they look at, can they also do a matching program for employee donations? And Balcom didn't have a matching pro program itself, it was just about to launch when this hit. Now, Cooler Kids is one of the matching opportunities for employees, you know, to match donations in cash. But also there's a opportunity for service hours. And that's really been, to me, a lot of the spin from this has been when a local community and one of our partners works with a pantry, the spinoff of that community being aware of the opportunity and seeing possibilities and going further that's really been the, the take home and it's a little bit like this call or this podcast where we found some great partners that we never even knew about or never knew these people before this happened but now we're working on projects together we're putting leads back and forth and for a lot of the people that participate it's a unexpected experience that's very positive an example is one of the guys came to the ribbon cutting when we uh, started their fridge up and his plant was less than a mile away from this location. And he goes, I'm ashamed to say I've driven past this for almost 15 years. I never knew it was here. And he goes, I'm 100% sure that there are some employees that have family members that are utilizing this. And we never even knew it was here mm -hmm. and could support it. But that every time we, we do one of these, we learn different pieces or you get people that are very passionate, like one of our team members, Eric in Ohio, <laughs> he took it as a personal affront that kids didn't have enough milk. And so he ended up taking what was seed money for one location, got enough seed money locally for three, plus supporting them long-term, plus when he went back the other week just to check in, got that gratification and 
good feeling that there's certain dairy companies that on the end of their route drop off what's left over so they don't have to throw it away. And he goes, they had buttermilk, they had 2%, they had chocolate milk, they had sour cream, they had eggs, and they had bacon, all in the refrigerated section. Hmm. And the pantry would never have that had they not had the opportunity. You know, and, and again, it lives on with some of the parents uses an opportunity to bring their kids in from scouts or baseball teams or any type of fundraising. And they go in and they have a matching program. So if the kids work so many hours at the food pantry or at, you know, breaking down these bulk items as they come in, you know, people will match that. So there's, it's been a really good way for a lot of people to connect and work with their local communities. And maybe they didn't know about it or didn't realize there was an opportunity to do things other than uh, donate a little bit of money. And I think that is kind of the epiphany that most people have right? It's like, oh, I don't think about just buying gallons of milk or yogurt and donating it to my local food pantry, right? People just don't think about it that way. They also don't think about donating refrigeration units until some of these programs have come along and really shine light onto what's possible if you do, you know, think about infrastructure and how to get it to to the, those people who, who don't necessarily get it. And, you know, one of the stories I want to share is just really briefly, but during the pandemic, is uh, my own team at my previous position would always tease me that I, I was buying up refrigeration and I was sending it to food banks. And that was like what I was working on. I'm like, well, little do you know um, that, you know, I was on the phone with Scott and Charlie and, you know, making these kind of plans. But uh, the letters that we would see coming in from some of the constituents who were receiving the dairy boxes during the pandemic under the farmers to family food boxes. And I know that was a exhaustive effort on the USDA's part and our food bank partners. And, um, but the gratitude that we saw with the dairy boxes, they, people, we had heard food from all of the food banks across the country and pantries that people would stand in line for hours for those dairy boxes. Sometimes maybe not so much of the other boxes um, and nothing against those other commodities, but people just, they, it was a luxury for them. And think there were things in there that maybe some of the processors um, would would be you know generous to donate like chocolate milk. And when you think about um, giving your kids something that maybe is is a higher priced item than regular white milk, chocolate milk was such a luxury, or mm. or sour cream dip um, that they could have with their vegetables or or meats. I mean, it just you think about the things that your family gets to enjoy. Um, on a daily basis and what what I have a little guy and and what we we get give him and you know hearing these stories of people being able to now have those other products it was just it tore us apart to be honest and it really fuels the passion that we have um, at cooler management for saying everybody deserves fresh foods and we are such a dairy you know you know in our roots here at cooler management we are such a dairy you know, champions and coming from that milk background and wanting kids to have access to milk and treats like chocolate milk, because we know that when kids, um, you know, have access to milk, they have fewer broken bones, they have healthier teeth, you know, it's calcium, vitamin D, protein, you know, it's like all those great things in a glass. And so I know like for us at Cooler Management, we're never going to stop until we get all those refrigeration units and whatever we need to do for mobile units or, um, lock-ins, whatever it is, to make sure that all the food banks, all the food pantry schools have that infrastructure because dairy is such an important piece of overall growth and nutrition that, um, you know, we're never going to give up until till it happens. And if that means, you know, working with all of our partners, like the, the teams that are on the phone to create these programs, um, you know, our processors like Dairy Farmers of America um, or the USDA is to help shine a light on Fresh is deserved by everyone, and um, there has to be some equality with the foods that we're given um, that that we get to enjoy, that everyone should get to enjoy to nourish their bodies. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, I cut you off before getting ready to tell us about that program, but but I know that uh, you know the Cool Kids programs participated in that. We put uh, coolers in place, and DFA puts milk in those coolers, right? And an empty cooler does us no good. So, what, why don't you talk a little bit about that program? 
So Scott, you're right. Uh, we quote unquote, fill the fridges that are placed through the Cooler Kids Partnership. Um, but we're not exactly doing that with physical milk product donations. So going back to the start of the pandemic, you know, with some of the conversations that you folks had with Melissa, we all sat around these tables, well, virtual tables, I guess, and tried to figure out what the food banks needed. And we thought we had it figured out. Um, and I'm a little embarrassed for how long it took me to say, well, why don't we just ask them what they need? And, and since then, we have completely shifted our thinking here. So the last thing that we wanted to do by donating dairy products, which are perishable to an emergency food provider, was burden them. Um, so instead, what we're doing is 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 providing funding for the purchase of dairy products. We say, please continue to procure your products the way that you have through the channels that you have, because the last thing we wanted to do, knowing that the entire dairy industry was facing uphill battle with marketing conditions, um, was to disadvantage somebody else in our space. Um, and we also wanted to give the food pantries flexibility in the types of items that they um, provide their clients. We know that USDA, like Melissa mentioned, the Farmers to Families Food Box program was wonderful and absolutely needed, but it was out of the ordinary and nobody knew how to deal with it and how it displaced the other foods that are available within the network. Um, so we told them, here's your funding, purchase dairy products. If it's from a cow and it's a dairy product, we're happy. And we've received such great feedback and photos from our pantries that we've supported. One pantry short, sort of sheepishly came and asked if it would be okay for them to buy ice cream for the students last day of school. Um, and we said, absolutely. And I'm going to get a little tear choked up. <laughs> but Melissa is correct. Uh, this really matters. And what we're doing here is very important. And it's a quality of life issue. It's an equity issue. And if you can't have cheese, <laughs> on your pizza, um, then, then what kind of American child are you? Excellent story. Um, Melissa, you was talking before about some of the different um, options you have in terms of refrigeration. And I'm, I'm thinking back to when I first started learning about this, that when we talk about pantries, we're usually talking about a basement in a church, right? Uh, and, and, you know, maybe they have some old uh, refrigerators that somebody threw away and maybe they work and maybe they don't, but talk about some of the different kinds of units that you have and, and how they're intended to be used. Maybe a little bit about talk about the pantries, the banks, which are different than that. And then, uh, and, and then maybe we'll have Mark or somebody, whoever would like to talk about those mobile units. I find those to be very interesting. Talk a little bit about those. Yeah. And I was actually, um, Mark, I'm wondering if you want to talk first about, um, how we got yeah, started on the food over. side with rescuing um, the refrigeration units and sending them to food banks and food pantries? Sure. So cooler management is a turnkey cold storage solutions company. That's, that's what we do from the beginning of the process to the decommissioning and donation to a food bank, if that's what ultimately happens to a piece of cold storage equipment in the, in the field. Uh, cooler management's sole purpose is to is to provide you know those cold storage solutions so everything from procurement to graphics to installation electrical work uh, even service and maintenance warranty management and then we look at you know at the back half of that uh, particular piece of equipment's life does it make sense when some of our retail partners you know we work with you know retail cpg companies they may go in a different direction they're going to merchandise a different product but they're in, you know, 100 stores or 500 stores across the country. Uh, we can actually do some work on that and get it into a food bank. And we've put over 3,000 pieces of equipment into food pantries across the country to date, which is a drop in the bucket. Really makes no impact, but it's doing something, right? Um, but we did. We got into doing that, um, and Feeding America took note of our our social equity um endeavors they saw what we were doing on the decommissioning before that thing went to you know the final resting state for it we could uh you know do some improvements we could do some service we could do a little bit of maintenance and we could get another two three years out of it and that that means something 
right? And I won't take credit for that. That's our that's our previous owner. Um, he saw that as an opportunity because he's got a big heart. And I think that runs through um, the entire company here at Cooler Management. It's one of the things I love the most about our team is that we do have this mindset that we can help and that we can provide access. But that's what uh, Cooler Management does is we help retail CPG brands, um, secondary and tertiary retail locations uh, market their products, create a point of uh, sale, point of uh, sale experience for consumers looking for you know, dairy, for wh whatever it is that they're looking for in the store. Rather than shopping the perimeter, they can you know, find their spot in the store. And then Mark found me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I told him about this whole world of, you know, food banks and food pantries. And um, he, he, you know, he already knew um, what was happening. And, you know, he's living through the pandemic and, and he bought cooler management. And, um, you know, they're, this is the side of business for the CPG side. Um, but we didn't have a hunger relief side at cooler management yet. Um, and that's uh, why Mark brought me on board is really to lead that and kind of take both of our visions um, that we that we share about hunger relief and food equity. And uh, we, we put together this campaign. It's called Fresh Has No Boundaries. And it's all about delivering those fresh foods to uh, families that need it most. And, and most of that effort is to rural populations or any inner city populations. Um, and you know, Mark, I don't want to steal any of your thunder and, uh, you know, how how we work here on the operations side, but it, it it's not easy to deliver a refrigeration unit down a flight or two upstairs in a church basement in in pantries across the country. And and that's what what happens, you know, whether we're delivering to a school or we're delivering to a, a pantry. And Charlie, I know you have some ideas, some uh, good stories to tell on on these two, but so do we and living through this. Um, and just learning kind of on the refrigeration side, I thought, mm, you know, how easy is it? It's probably pretty easy just to go online and order a refrigeration unit and it's delivered and all done. Like, what does this cooler management company do? And when I found out more and I started kind of talking to some of our partners and say, yeah, um, we can't just call up a refrigeration company and, and have them deliver a refrigeration unit because then it sits outside our school or outside of our food bank. And it never goes down that flight of stairs and they never coordinate with the volunteers and we don't know it's working or there's an issue within the installation. Um, and even a brand new unit may show up and it's not working, right? Those coils don't work. The fans don't work. The temperature isn't being held. And Mark saw this. And, you know, that's that's kind of our core with our operations team is to say, we're not going to do that. We are not going to do that. Um, and our team really tries to take care of that whole process to make sure we're not calling Stephanie and Charlie and Scott, you know, all hours of the day saying, hey, that refrigeration unit you delivered or you sent to us doesn't work. Right. We try and take care of that for the team and make sure that the pantry gets up and running as quickly as possible um, with with no fuss. You know, they have so much to work on at each of these pantry and food bank locations. They're worried about volunteers. They're worried about food donations. They're worried about monetary. They're worried about helping these families make ends meet. Right. Are the families going to afford rent or gas or groceries or, or some other thing where. I've really seen our food banks and food pantries step up in so many different ways, whether it's mental health care or um, it is things like, hey, we, we blew a tire. A family blew, or, they blew their tire this week and they can't get to work if they don't have that tire and they're giving them the money for that tire. Right. And so if we can take one more thing off of their plate at the food pantry level and say, don't worry about it, your refrigeration unit's coming. You literally just have to be there to accept it. You don't have to worry about labor or trying to get it down the steps yourselves and figure out if it's working. That then we've done our job here at Polar Management. We really yeah. try, try to to make that process easy, and we're proud of it because it's working. It's successful, and the gratitude that we get. And I don't want you to think that we take credit for it because we certainly push it back to our, our partners at Falcom and um, and DFA Cares. 
but they're just overwhelmingly grateful on how easy that process is. And then when they also get a check for filling the fridge with dairy, they're like, we've won the lottery. There's no way that you've chosen our pantry for a freezer unit or a refrigeration unit. And when, and then, you know, with the refrigeration units that, that, um, that donation of stocking the fridge with fresh dairy. And um, just to kind of tell you anecdotally, a story that we got last week was um, one of our partners shared with us, um, one of the small pantries, they said, you know, we just can't even believe that you're filling the fridge with dairy. Normally, we're only able to buy dairy a few times a year, and it's for special holidays like Christmas. And staff, you know, like it just kills me when you you know kids are just so excited because they get to have milk with their cereal in the morning mm. right it's those little small things of like really changing the difference and you know for kids they don't get it they're like okay i get to have milk with my cereal and it tastes so good and i get to drink the milk with my cereal and maybe it's fruit flavored now instead of just regular flavored but um you know some of the things that we take for granted as a luxury and i don't need to tell any of you guys that but i mean just those small things make such a big difference and when you're struggling as a mom or a dad and you're like god i gotta get my my toddler to eat this breakfast in the morning before they go to school or daycare or something how much better do you feel when they eat it and they go to school and you know that they're going to be prepared to learn that day and that's just i feel like the impact that we all get to make and feel um, on the programs that we run in the food banks and food pantries that we get to run. But I know it's just, just a small thing that we, we are contributing, but it makes such a big impact to them. It does. And Charlie, I'll say I, the, we hired Melissa beginning of this year, January. And I think your name was the first name that, that she had mentioned. She said, <laughs> we're going to find a way to work with Charlie. And it's because of that mindset, right? I take it back to the business case. Right, I'm, the audience is listening to the business case here. There is a true displacement opportunity for dairy, and the previous podcast that I did on this topic was doing good in business. And when you can do good in a capitalist, you know, environment, it, it's it meets the needs of all of the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And I, I have. I have a story, right? We all have stories of why we're doing what we're doing in this in this environment. And I was a substitute teacher um, trying to get back into the league and I was on bus duty. Little girl was frantic, had to run back into the classroom to get her coat. Uh, I'll go get the coat for you, just hold tight. Ran back in, grabbed her coat off the chair and food fell out of her coat pockets. Hmm. And come to find out she was bringing food home every night in both of her pockets for her and her mom. They were living in their car. Right. And to this day, it never, it, it's never lost on me of the importance of what we're doing. I mean, this is a person who would have taken any type of food, right? We're talking about bringing fresh food because there is a health correlation, right? Unhealthy food equals unhealthy people. And that's not a solution, right? That's why we need refrigeration because healthy food equals a healthy family, right? But that little girl, you know, it, it it's important to remember those stories and it keeps us motivated. It certainly keeps us motivated, but without understanding the business part of this, which is what the industry looks at is why would we invest $90 million into 30,000 coolers and food pantries across the country? It has to make sense. And it, and it makes sense because when you can invest in doing the right thing, it's a win-win. And I, and, I, and I love that part of what we're talking about on this podcast. It's, it's, um, it's a great opportunity for the dairy industry. It's a great opportunity for helping our country, helping people, like real people, um, you know, provide, provide for themselves and, and to have that learning mentality that Melissa mentioned we all been hungry before we're distracted right and if you're just filled with junk that doesn't that doesn't solve anything right you get a 5 10 20 minute high and you crash right and so it truly is about sustainable nutrition and um kind of building off that is steph 
I, when I think about sustainable nutrition, I think about kind of the cycle of food and how important farmers are to that cycle. And, you know, us hearing the stories. And as you mentioned in the podcast, there's so many farmers who, you know, are selling their farms or they're not farming. The next generation isn't farming um, and how important it is to, to support our farmers. And, um, you know, a lot of the grants with USDA and what, what, what we look at every single day, sometimes there's an unequal balance where I think when people think about farming, they think about produce farmers. They don't always think about the dairy farmers. Um, and that is something that's really come to light in such a big way for me over the last couple of years. And maybe you could talk to a little bit more about just supporting our dairy farmers. And I think when people think about, okay, well, I can go and get corn and avocados and watermelons, and I can take that to my local food bank, but they don't necessarily think about going to a dairy farm and getting all those dairy products because they also have to be processed. Um, but anyway, yeah. I'd love for you, your perspective on that, just helping our dairy farmers thrive as well. Yeah, Melissa, I'm so I'm so glad you mentioned that um, because at the start of the pandemic, we started giving out this funding and telling them to purchase whatever dairy products were local to them. Um, and I can't even count how many phone calls I got that said, I have a dairy farm down the road. How do I, how do I call them? How do I pick up milk? Um, so another huge part that the dairy industry has played in this is the education role. Um, we just recently had the most wonderful opportunity and Melissa and Charlie joined us with Feeding America in Kansas City. We had a Feed, uh, Feeding America, Dairy Nourishes America Midwest Symposium, which was a conference that invited food bank professionals and dairy industry staff, as well as folks who support those two buckets of folks to Kansas City to really just start discussing this. And the most important thing on the agenda from my perspective was the farm tour. I wanted to be able to bring those food bank staff who work incredibly hard and are constantly getting information about the products that they're seeing coming and go throughout their network um, and bring them to a farm. And we brought them to Heinz Family Farm, which is a farm family just outside of Kansas City, milking a bunch of cows, um, an industrial farming operation owned by a family, um, a father, a son and their families. And we showed them there's no place to purchase milk here. But it goes to Highland, which is the local milk processor. Um, so, you know, being in this situation and being able to, to share about how the dairy supply chain works is just another tick on the winds here. Um, we do know that most Americans are very disconnected from their food supply. And I do think if the pandemic did one, one favor for us was kind of exposing that to them. Um, but we know that we're doing the right thing here and that our farmers um, support us as well. Um, but Melissa's right. You can't just show up at a dairy farm and, and pick up a gallon of milk. So, well, One of the neat experiences at that session was DFA hosted us at their new headquarters, which was a beautiful facility, great for meetings. And they had a very, very nice spread for breakfast, lunch, but the press, especially the breakfast struck people. And so, you know, a lot of people traditionally don't eat much breakfast anymore. And of course, when you have everything you can think of, every breakfast meat, every, bre every egg dish, everything has cheese, you know, these folks were loading their plates up and enjoying it. And then of course, anything that was left over went to a local pantry there. So nothing went to waste. But the comments, as I talked with the people at my table, you know, they, they have not seen that. Now, again, that's that's kind of normal for a lot of the farm families that grow up and work hard every day. But a lot of families, you know, breakfast is grabbed on the go out. And, you know, the way that we consume milk and other dairy can really fit in that lifestyle because of the nutrition piece of it. So that was a it was just fun to watch the impact that people had. And also personally, they don't get to talk to many corporate people. And I, that's why I call myself at these. And they're like, well, why are you here? And we explained some of this stuff. And they go, well, why would you do that? And I said, well, I said, it's not only the right thing to do from an agriculture industry standpoint, but selfishly, 
our employees and especially our next generation of employees that are coming in want to know that the company is doing things kind of the marks point for the greater good of the industry or they want to be part of something that they can participate in and it's not just about a paycheck you know and, and even now i worked this week with two of our new hires who are working with some placements and they're thrilled because they've got a network and they can go work with them in a different role now it's just a whole different way of approaching you know back to mark's point doing business and doing good can work very well together you know and it's it's just a good sustainable way to do it you're right and i think you know when we all want to make a donation sometimes we think oh well this is really going to make an impact or i can only make a 20 dollar donation how would that help right but charlie you and and stephanie have really honed that in to figure out how do we um you know collaborate with others how do we extend our reach how do we work with our partners to um you know we're buying refrigeration this time and they're gonna fill the fridge with dairy or they're gonna fill the fridge with another uh, product. I know that you you know, you know, work through a lot of the, the other food providers as well, because, and that that's something I do wanna bring up on the call. And, and Scott, you, you, you brought this up, so I don't wanna take credit for it, but it, it is, you know, we focus on a lot of, of the refrigeration infrastructure side. And then, you know, with, with our partners at DFA Cares is dairy. But, you know, if you can't, put a refrigeration unit into a pantry, that's okay, but what could you do? And is it a food donation? Is it a dairy donation? Is it creating your own sales program where you're building things like this or internal employee program? Um, I think when people think about pandemic and they're like, well, it's over and there's no more food use uh, or no more food you know, shortages or needs out there, but that's just not, that's not the case, right? Everything is inflated with pricing, gas prices are up, food prices are up, rent is up, and um, people are just struggling to make ends meet. So even if you can't say, hey, I'm going to, you know, put a refrigeration unit out there, you can't put, you know, a couple thousand dollar check with fill the fridge with with Jerry out there, um, you know, could you make a smaller donation and aggregate that to some of the bigger campaigns that we're running in partnerships together? Why don't we specifically talk about some of those things? You know, I'm sure we've got people listening today says, listen, guys, you've got my ear. I want to participate. How? So what are some specifics? Stephanie, let's start with you. How if they want to if they want to um, participate with DFA, DFA Cares, one of the other programs, how can they do that? Who do they contact? Well, first off, if you want to support the dairy industry, I would encourage you to go out and buy some dairy products and make sure your fridges are stocked with them. Um, another call to action would be maybe volunteer at your local food pantry. Um, sometimes what prohibits a food pantry from accepting a donation of food is the transportation. Um, and so this reach out, they're usually uh, very happy to accept your help. Um, but for September Hunger Action Month, which we're in September, it's September Hunger Action Month, um, we are just so excited to celebrate that the Farmers Feeding Families Fund has, has raised over $950,000. And so hopefully by the end of this month, um, from asking our staff, our producers and industry partners to donate, um, we're hoping to donate or raise the last $50,000. Um, we have a match from the DFA Cares Foundation. We'll match $20,000 as well. Um, so you can go to our website, uh, dfamilk.com and you follow the prompts for DFA Cares and you can make a donation there. What if we're um, a, a large integrator and you wanna donate uh, um, product in kind, poultry or pork and, and a lot of it, do we have any guidance for people uh, that wanna do that? Do they contact uh, Feeding America? What, what's your experience? What's your guidance on that? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah, um, this is, this is a great question because it comes up all the time is, um, you know, I think you can certainly contact us at Cooler Management, um, you know, Feeding America, we can get you in contact with them. Um, but the, the biggest thing is it needs to um, be understood of, of what kind of sizing it's in. Is it a household size? Does it need to be cut up? Um, you know, because the I think the biggest thing is, I think, 
consumer wise and CPG wise is they they think, OK, well, outside of dairy, which is packaged um, pretty, pretty well for household si sizes overall, um, some of our uh, food banks across the country, they just can't accept huge donations um, of sides of beef for larger packages. And but they do have clean rooms in certain areas where they can um, actually put that that meat or that that poultry or even cheese into smaller household sizes. So Feeding America is really trying to make some leaps and bounds with providing some of these clean rooms um, so that they can take in uh, higher quantities of whatever is being donated. But we can be a hand in that at cooler management. We work with Feeding America Corporate. We do work on the dairy side and the protein side. Um, so happy to help with that. Or if it's a local donation, you know, can we connect you to one of our Feeding America food pantries or, or outside of Feeding America? We work with organizations like Catholic Charities or um, YMCA or some of our dairy partners through the Dairy Council across the country. Um, how do we help save any of that food? And if we can be a resource, um, you know, Mark and, and our vision together has really been where can we help? And if it's uh, pro bono, then then that's not a big deal. We need to to help and save that fresh food and help get it to wherever it needs to to be. And so um, we would welcome that at Cooler Management um, of of trying to be a resource for anyone who's making those donations. Okay, Charlie, if somebody, uh, one of our customers, um, Allied Industry, if they wanted to participate with us with placing coolers in some of the locations that we're working with, um, how can they go about doing that? So the, the short answer is just contact your Balcom rep and that'll usually funnel back either to you or myself and we'll get rolling on it. But a lot of times to your point, Scott, we've had several dairies that wanted to donate animals to be part of this. And that's where you make a, you know, we end up making a phone call to Melissa because it's not just the getting it processed. It's where do you find enough cooler space to handle these things? And it's, you know, what's great about working with Melissa is she may not be the right person, but the networks that her and Mark have from all the things they're doing allows them access to the, and that's what I saw at that meeting with DFA that Steph helped put together is the food pantries are busy focusing on the people that are coming in. And Feeding America is doing an outstanding job at a really high level, handling a lot of things. I mean, a tremendous amount of things. But the devil is in the details on some of the day-to-day -day stuff. And that's where a lot of the agriculture-based resources in rural America want to plug in. And, you know, we, we struggled with it, even working with M Melissa, because with working with staff at these food pantries, there's a lot of turnover, they're busy. You got to have a system. And that just has been something that's evolved. But now with Melissa's help and then Stephanie on working with us on getting the money to flow. We've got systems in place so we can help them build their own system, but it's taken us 18 months to get our system rolling along, you know? So, you know, there's other partners who they just love the fact they could plug and play with us. Novus, DSM, they said, look, where do I sign up? How much, is there a place I can send the money easily with the credit card? And that's what Steph helped us set up with the website. And then when they go to get the coolers placed, they'll help have people come in and work at the pantries those days. They just want to know where to show up and do things. But all those details in the back, you know, that first year, uh, our team did a lot of that. That's not our wheelhouse. You know, it was it was rewarding to a point, but we don't we're not the experts in it. And so, you know, that that's the learning is that is if another corporate company comes in. There's a lot of work that a lot of people like Stephanie, Melissa, and Mark are already doing that we can just plug into, and they can put them in charge or in contact with the right people. Yeah, yeah. thanks for saying that, Charlie. I mean, we we take pride in we literally do everything. We snap a picture, we send it to you, and say the work's done. And you are good at what you do, and our customers and clients are good at what they do, and we're good at what we do. But when we can do that turnkey solution, snap a picture, say the work is done. That's, you know, that just creates efficiencies, right? And it, and it gets everything moving faster. And, it, and at the end of the day, it's a quicker solution to the end, right? It, it's, it's getting us to the point where we all collectively want to be at 
And, you know, we just play a small part in it. Right? It takes it takes everyone to do what they do well. But, you know, Melissa and our, and, and our team, we, you know, we, we just enjoy doing it. And, and we do a pretty, pretty good job at it. I just try and stay out of everybody's way. So if I can kind of summarize with what I just heard there is don't be afraid to start your own program, right? There's a lot of benefits for the community, for your salespeople, for your company, and don't be afraid, right? Because there are resources available. We've kind of uh, made some of the mistakes and we've, we, we, we've learned from it. We've met the right people. Um, and so please contact us. We'd be happy to help you and, and, and share with our, our experiences and help you create your own yeah. program. We'll put the contact information in the uh the show notes of the program uh guys this has been a, a humbling conversation you guys have, are doing an amazing job uh, i appreciate all of you and all that you're doing for uh people uh, hungry people uh for agriculture you're great ambassadors so it, it this has been a great conversation i don't know if you noticed or not but they flickered the lights that means that uh, it's it's last call <laughs> and so with last call what i'm going to ask each of you to do is is talk a little bit about um how the need may be evolving, and then what's next for DFA, for cooler kids, for cooler management. And Our last call question is sponsored by AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine, the next generation in amino acid balancing. With AminoSure XM, you can save up to $0.05 cents per cow per day on your methionine investment. Try it today and receive an additional $0.2.5 cents per cow per day savings with Balchem's limited-time rebate offer. Contact your Belchem representative to learn more. Stephanie, why don't I start with you? Well, Scott, thanks for uh, teeing that up. So um, like you mentioned before, uh, so just like the communities that we're working to support, we're also building this community of folks who support it. So I never thought in a million years in 2020 that looking two years down the road that I would have such a supportive network. Um, I think that people on this call, we can solve any problem that's thrown to us. And so I really encourage you all to join us. Um, DFA will continue doing this work. Um, just wanted to mention that, you know, actual dairy product donations are occurring every day from all of DFA's brands. Um, since the start of the pandemic, we've donated 34.6 million servings of dairy um, equivalent since the start of the pandemic, which is just incredible. And we're just one dairy company. Um, so we're just really excited to continue doing this work down the future. We know that recovering from this pandemic is not a flip of the light switch and that our communities will be recovering and hopefully finding a better way to support those communities as we move forward. So Scott, thank you so much for having me. And um, it was it was really a pleasure. Well, thank you, Stephanie. You've been a great guest. Uh, look forward to meeting you in person someday. Charlie, why don't we uh, go with you next? So I think what, what we've learned, Scott, as we've worked through this is there's value in this as an activity with food awareness, food safety, I mean, and, and security. But really from a corporate standpoint or from a company standpoint, it's about the relationships we build with our customers doing something together and it's a very interesting opportunity with the next generation of employees who are looking for that with the companies that they're going to select that they work with so there's a lot of intrinsic value in that the other thing is we started a program where we do a matching for folks that work in our plants or our own employees anywhere but they didn't know what that money would go toward you know, other than what they first donated. So now when you kind of create this and you also give them the opportunity to go work in the pantries and put some hours in, it gets a lot more traction and a lot more energy around it. And it builds a really nice community, whether it's the working group in an area or the you know, manufacturing plant or even the home office. And so those are some of the things that I don't think we had, you know, we, Jonathan threw it to us and said, how do we handle this milk being dumped and do something positive for the industry? And it's evolving to something totally different. And that is really cool. Hmm. Well said, Charlie. Um, Melissa, Mark, who wants to go next? Melissa, sure. you want to go? You know that I always want to talk, Scott. I mean, like, and Mark, poor Mark is knows that. So, um, 
You know, I just want to say first and foremost, the passion that's on the phone, that's in the room, in the virtual room is just always so impressive. And when you can get up every day and work with this group of people and know that you're not only going to work for a business, but you are changing the lives of people across the country. I mean, it's a pretty rewarding uh, program that we're running together and what we get to do on an everyday basis. So I just want to thank all of you on the phone. Everybody's listening is, you know, just the gratitude that we have at Glor Management for the partners um, and the work that we get to do with you. Um, and for, for what's up for, for next for us, it's always innovation. It is always making sure that we are thinking about what the food banks need, what, what do our CPGs need? What do our retailers need? What do our partners need? And having an answer for that. And so, um, you know, early this year, we launched something called the Parkit Market, which is a mobile refrigerated pant food pantry. And that is really something that we've been focusing on because um, in, in the hunger world, you know, not only do we want to give people a box of food, we want to give them a box of food that they can choose, right? That their families, they want to eat that meets their dietary restrictions that they get to choose. And there's a lot of dignity that comes with that. And I think that's a part of the program and the work that we do is a lot of the coolers that we place are also um, glass door refrigerated units and people get to open those doors and they get to choose what's for their family. And I think keeping food dignity top of mind is very important to us and innovation is very important to us. Um, and just constantly listening to our network of what their needs are. Um, and the last thing I would say that we focus on, and, and this is probably a little bit different that you would think to hear from somebody like Cooler Management, but it is using all the dollars for the grants that are on the table from USDA or local, you know, local grants at the government level or state level to make sure that not a dollar of that gets wasted. And it goes to, you know, getting each of our families out there food to eat every night. So, you know, there's a there's billions of dollars of grants out there. But if, if food banks and food pantries don't know about it, then it's going to waste and we don't want that to happen. And so whether it's going to refrigeration or not, we're here to help our, you know, connect some of those dots and um, be a bigger player for overall um, nutritious foods for everyone. Um, you know, that's just one of our focuses at Cooler Management. So again, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Charlie, for letting us be on here. It's such a pleasure to be your partner. And this was so much fun today. So uh, thank, thank, you. thank you, Melissa. We thank, thank you for everything you do. Mark, we're going to give you the final word. Yeah, well, you know, that's why I hired Melissa, because she says it all so well. <laughs> you know, I, I think with the final word. You all heard that. I just want to say, you all heard that. <laughs> um, it comes down to people, right? It comes down to the people at the farm gate raising livestock, raising crops, doing what they do on the farm for us so we don't have to. Right? It comes down to the business case in the charitable food system, in my mind. The more exposure we place on the lack of infrastructure, the more money that's pumped into the charitable food system, the more people that will be helped, the more people we can employ, the more people that hopefully will get out of the charitable food system because they have access to healthy, fresh food and they will remember that they had the opportunity and they had the access to fresh, healthy food. And I do believe, you know, bottom of my heart, I believe that they won't be in that charitable food system if we do something about it. Right now, I believe that there's a house with shingles on it without a foundation in the charitable food system, right? We've got all of this food being pumped into the charitable food system, and that's great. But without a proper infrastructure and foundation, it's going to waste. And if we do something about that, 30,000 coolers in my mind is half of all of the food pantries right now in the charitable food system. For the next 10 years, that's about how long these quality refrigeration units will last. That means for the next 10 years, we don't have to think about refrigeration. We can think about where the food comes from. And I believe that's the solution. So Scott, thank you for the time. Very welcome, Mark. That was well said and a great way to, to end our conversation this evening. Um, Mark, Stephanie, Melissa, Charlie, uh, this has been humbling, as I said before. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, I want to thank you for your vision and your dedication to feeding those in need and helping bring the industry together to make an even bigger impact. 
I um, also want to thank you for joining us tonight and shining a light on what else we can do to help those in the most need. Our loyal listeners, thank you for hanging in there with us uh, as we tackle this unique topic and bring new projects, programs, and ideas to you. We hope we've inspired some new thinking and local action. Please reach out with your ideas, and we'll do all we can to bring the right local players together to make it happen. With that, I hope you've learned something. I hope you had some fun, and I hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests, so please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars. Mm-hmm.